It's on! Again. The undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world, Ingo! Ingemar Johansson was back to defend his crown. Johansson was undefeated throughout the 1950s, culminating in his upset of the reserved and protected now ex-champion. The ex-champ, Floyd Patterson, had his history-making 1950s end in oblivion at the hands of Ingo. Imagine becoming the youngest heavyweight champion ever, and by defeating a man who would have been the oldest heavyweight champion ever. You're the should-be successor to Rocky Marciano, and it all comes crashing down in spite of how deliberately managed your reign has been. Thus, Patterson challenged his conqueror, Ingemario Johansson for the heavyweight title. Last time, Patterson was the betting favorite at odds of 5-1. to one. This time, Johansson was the favorite at 8-5. to five. Remember that it was more than an upset last time, but an embarrassment with Patterson tasting the canvas seven times. Was Floyd Patterson being protected by Custy Amato and did it backfire? This is proving grounds here. Patterson stuck to the game plan, aggression, before he met the hammer of Thor again. This time, Patterson discovered that he could take Johansson's patented right hand and allowed his confidence to bud all the way to the fifth round. In said round, he hurt the champion with a right before downing him with the now famous gazelle punch. Ingo answered the count only to meet a savage assault of left hooks and was promptly finished by what may be the hardest punch ever thrown. Johansson failed to answer this time, counted out by referee Arthur Mercanti in his first world title bout. That's how you avenge a loss. Floyd Patterson had once again made history. Not only was he the youngest heavyweight champion in history, but he was now the only man to ever regain the heavyweight crown. Jim Corbett twice, Bob Fitzsimmons, Jim Jeffries, Jack Dempsey, Max Schmeling, Joe Lewis, Ezra Charles thrice, and Jersey Joe Walcott had all failed before him. No matter how you slice it, the gentleman of boxing is a pillar in heavyweight history now. 1960 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. Floyd Patterson was once again the heavyweight champion of the world. Does this mean that the title picture will be as stagnant as it was beforehand? We'll have to wait and see, but I wouldn't get my hopes up for any changes if I were you. Just how much longer will Sonny Liston have to wait to get his shot? The title picture remains stagnant to a degree, but maybe a rubber match between Floyd Patterson and Ingemar Johansson will shake things up again. That and the numerous contenders who remain in line may finally get to spice up the contemporary title bouts. Sonny Liston had torn through the division like he was the champion on the defense, but he'll have to keep waiting. It's frustrating, but reality. The previously desired rubber match that I mentioned between Patterson and Johansson appears to be on the horizon for the impending 1961. Let's hope it lives up to the first two and gets us some much needed progress in the tale of the heavyweight championship. Call it a trilogy, the rubber match between Floyd Patterson and Ingemar Johansson was signed on January 19th for a March 13th date. While preparing for this bout, Johansson sparred with young Cassius Clay. Clay with Johansson, making the contender look like the sparring partner. Ingo gave Clay credit. Now that both men understood the damage the other could dish out, I'm talking Patterson and Johansson again now, you'd probably expect this to be a more reserved affair. 
Well, you'd be vastly wrong. In the opening round alone, Patterson was down twice and Johansson once. The new mandatory eight count rule was immediately put to use. In fact, it was the first time a heavyweight title bout had a mandatory eight count. Patterson's miraculous powers of recovery were on display and his knockdown of Ingo marked the history books as the first time in 40 years both men went down in the opening round of a heavyweight title bout. That was Dempsey Furpo. Back to the present. Patterson erased any thought that this would be a repeat of the first affair. It turned into a back and forth battle of the wills from here, a teeter-totter of momentum that culminated in Patterson wanting it more and scoring the knockout in the sixth. To the challenger's credit, he tried his best to answer, but his body couldn't match his heart. Ingo complained of a fast count, but it was revealed he actually had a long count. Big time legacy win here for Floyd Patterson. Now, I'm happy for you and all, champ. But what about Sonny Liston? When's the fight happening? The main event of our doubleheader, history does indeed rhyme. Undisputed heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson welcomed the challenge of Tom McNeely Jr. Recognize the surname? That's right. This man is Hurricane Peter McNeely's father, the man who gave history one of the most overblown events against Mike Tyson over 30 years later. Seriously, everywhere you look here on YouTube has some shtick about how much of a boss Mike Tyson was and they used the McNeely fight as evidence. Casual sometimes hurt my soul. Back to business. McNeely acted as a tune-up for Floyd in light of his next big title bout. The amount of times Tom went down is debated, ranging from 8 to 13. What matters is that Patterson outclassed him. Now, why did I call this a rhyme in history? Well, Patterson and Tyson are similar enough style-wise, and both are students of Amato. Neither of the McNeely's stood too crazy a chance, but Tom lasted longer than his son and even managed to stun his peekaboo opponent. It's amazing how history unfolds. Interesting stuff. 1961 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. As amazing as that rubber match was between Floyd Patterson and Ingemar Johansson, one can't help but cringe at the fact that Floyd's management will once again hold the title hostage in the vice grip known as his protected reign. If anything, the trilogy with Ingo may make Cuss even more cautious. We've got a painfully long line of contenders just waiting for dream matches with Patterson for the title. Chief among those contenders still is Sonny Liston. Well, we've got another one in the books. Will 1962 see Floyd Patterson open up and welcome a true threat to his title? My mind says obviously not, but my heart is holding out hope. Believe it or not, there are whispers that a deal is on the horizon for Sonny Liston to finally get his shot for the title. If it is true, it's proven grounds for each man's legacy and should yield one for the ages. I guess we'll just have to wait and see in the coming 1962. Sonny Liston had knocked out eight of the top ten en route to this long overdue affair. The only two he didn't knock out simply refused to fight him in the first place. Those two men were Sir Henry Cooper and former champion Ingemar Johansson. Custy Amato protected his champion Floyd Patterson for as long as he could, but it was time for the gentlemen of boxing to face the dynamite. To clarify, Floyd himself wanted to fight Liston and overruled evading him any further. They officially signed on March 16th, 
to fight later on September 25th. The contract detailed a significant rematch clause that we'll address after covering the fight. Speaking of which, Sonny Liston absolutely dominated and destroyed the champion in the opening round, becoming the first heavyweight to win the title by first round knockout. Floyd couldn't hope to harm a hair on Sonny's head. It was one-sided, point blank. But you've got to admire Floyd trying his best to beat the count. Some of the nastiest blows you'll see. Two minutes and six seconds of Charles Sonny Liston enforcing his will and exercising his frustration. He'd been ducked for so long, only to capture the crown so expediently. Maybe the 8-5 to five odds in Sonny's favor were too generous toward Floyd. Cuss knew it, the boxing world knew it, Sonny definitely knew it, and maybe Floyd did too. Liston was destined to be heavyweight champion. The fear set in for the boxing world as Liston's ties to the mob left a heavyweight crown in the suspended unknown. By that I mean the mob now had an obvious control over the title. Or, or, allegedly. Gotta be careful here. Let's talk about that contract from earlier. Patterson was guaranteed a rematch within a year and retained the rights to dictate the terms. Liston had to agree to these terms as it was the only way to secure the title bow. The WBA would take note. 1962 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. Unbelievable! The heavyweight title is finally out of the vice. Sonny Liston, in historic fashion, has become the new heavyweight champion. Crazy thing is, he already cleaned out the division on his way to the top. So what more can we expect from the new champion? The division looks to be wide open. Sonny Liston fears no man. Floyd Patterson is guaranteed a rematch in the coming 1963. The contenders in line should see some movement soon. It's an exciting time for the heavyweight division outside of the fact that the new champion has mob ties. Oh. And how about that Olympian Cassius Clay? He's looking good, even in the face of some adversity. Like I said, exciting times to be a fan. Off to 1963 we go. It should be a good one. The return bout as promised, undisputed world's heavyweight champion Charles Sonny Liston is ready to hold up his end of the bargain against ex-champion Floyd Patterson. Can Patterson do it again, regain the heavyweight championship as he did against Ingemar Johansson? The 4-1 to one odds in favor of Liston say no. The fight was pushed back multiple times. Here's the timeline. It was originally set for April 4th and then April 10th, but Sonny Liston had a recurring knee injury. The new date was June 27th. But then Floyd Patterson needed a benign tumor removed from between his fourth and fifth knuckles on his right hand. Thus, July 22nd became the date of destiny. This time, Liston dropped Patterson three times, the third yielding the knockout at two minutes and 10 seconds of the opening round. Patterson lasted four extra seconds, but it was otherwise a repeat. At least Floyd rose twice this time before being finished. Styles make fights. That much is clear between these two. You'll see something similar when we get to 1973. Liston's clear-cut repeat over Patterson led to the WBA acting on the rematch clause and contracts. After all, what was the point of this match when it was clear Liston would piece up Patterson again? I'll describe the details of the WBA's decision in the miscellaneous section. 
Patterson was so embarrassed that he left the arena in a disguise, an anxiety that would stay with the ex champ It's also worth noting that Liston became the newly formed WBC's first heavyweight world champion with this win, bolstering their legitimacy. Who in the world could hope to stand a chance against this juggernaut, this evil monster, this hellacious pugilist who is a headbreaker in and out of the ring? Even the police struggle with listening. Seriously, he's going to reign for as long as he wants. 1963 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. The heavyweight title remains in the controversial hands of Sonny Liston, but at least it won't be held hostage. In fact, he's even got another belt to add to his deck with the arrival of the WBC. All those contenders in line who so badly wanted Floyd Patterson have met a new conundrum in the form of being lambasted by perhaps the most terrifying champion in heavyweight history. Sonny Liston is the undisputed king, and I can't see anyone dethroning him anytime soon. This is the definition of a champion who will reign for as long as he wants. His first title defense was to be a sign that he was not a champion like his predecessor, as it was against the number one ranked Cassius Clay. As mentioned before, what chance does Clay realistically have against this man cut from the same cloth as Jack Dempsey? It's time to zip that mouth shut for good in 1964. Or are we in store for the biggest upset in boxing history so far? You never know in the world of heavyweight boxing. Put up or shut up, it's time. 22-year-old Cassius Clay must face the scariest champion in boxing history in light of all the insults and showboating he did. Obviously, Liston was the overwhelming favorite at odds of 7-1, to one, and out of 46 sports writers, 43 picked him to win. I'd say that's still generous. It was thought that he would kill young Cassius. Can you blame them or anyone else, especially after Clay's subpar 1963? The build-up to this fight is insane, rife with Clay at his arguable best as a showman. Cassius claimed that if Liston beat him, he'd kiss the champ's feet, crawl out of the ring on his knees, tell Sonny he's the greatest, and take the first jet out of the country. With limitless confidence, he hurled insult after insult after insult at Liston, even renting a bus and driving it to Liston's home in the middle of the night to taunt the champion. Oh, by the way, the bus was labeled, Sonny Liston will go in eight. Clay also declared Liston to be the big, ugly bear, indirectly giving him a now honored moniker. Cassius Clay declared that Sonny Liston was too ugly to be the champ and that the champ should be pretty like himself. If you were around, you were most likely watching this fight just to see Clay get his mouth stuffed with Liston's fist. My father was eight years old at the time and he remembers his grandfather listening to the fight on the radio. Speaking of Liston, he was so invincible in intimidating a champion that Henry Cooper stated he'd want a shot at the title if Clay won, but not any time while Liston was champion. Clay's association with the black Muslims was becoming more apparent, a fact that scared promoter Bill McDonald. Clay agreed not to mention his being a Muslim until after the fight after refusing to denounce the group openly. Clay's antics at the weigh-in cost him a $2,500 fine and led everyone to believe he was terrified. In reality, he was trying to psych out Liston and was ready to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Well, we're centering now. No more waiting. 
Clay was advised by Angelo Dundee to use his height as a countermeasure to Liston's intimidating gaze. At the bell, Cassius Clay came out like grease lightning, faster, smoother, and deadlier than we'd ever seen him. Liston couldn't touch him and looked flustered. Clay stung at will while making Liston whiff on just about everything. In fact, Cassius Clay looked twice the fighter he'd been in 1963. What a turnaround and testament of greatness. This continued through the end of the fourth, where Clay returned to his corner and complained of foul play, demanding his gloves be cut off so it could be proven. Angie Dundee shut it down and washed Clay's eyes out. Remember Eddie Machen's complaint from back in 1960 that I told you would return in significance? Liston had a substance put on his gloves and rubbed it into Clay's eyes mid-round. Clay was instructed to get on his bike and survive, enduring the burning and the blindness. He somehow did and regained control in the sixth round, landing at will on the champion. On his stool, before the seventh could begin, Sonny Liston informed his corner he couldn't continue, citing a shoulder injury. He failed to answer the bell, and Cassius Clay went into another frenzy in which he came to the realization that he was, in fact, the new heavyweight champion of the world. He told everyone to eat their words and declared himself the greatest. Was this a cherry pick gone wrong? Did Liston grant Clay the shot because of his less than impressive 1963? Who knows, and what of the shoulder injury? Would Sonny Liston ever actually quit in a fight? Was this a fix? Did the Nation of Islam threaten Sonny? Did Liston's mob ties have a play? His purse was withheld until the shoulder injury could be confirmed, and it was confirmed. Years later, one of Liston's cornermen said it was all BS and that the rematch clause would have been in danger had Liston simply quit. Liston was throwing his left normally after all. Eddie Machen, obviously, co-signed Clay in his liniment accusation, saying Sonny did the same to him in their fight. Machen said Clay was unwise to show he was affected, however, claiming himself to be a more seasoned pro. Who's the one who beat Liston again, Eddie? Anyway, you decide what you want to believe. Two days later, Cassius Clay announced that he was a member of the Nation of Islam and would go by Cassius X, rejecting his slave name as all black Muslims did. A new era had dawned. One which would overshadow the division, arguably, to this day. 1964 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. The heavyweight championship was due for a ride, but who could have seen this coming? Cassius Cl uh, Cassius X, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I think that's it. For the benefit of this broadcast, he is the new heavyweight champion and the world has been accordingly shook. Did you bet on Clay? I sure as hell didn't. If it wasn't open before, the division is for sure busted open now. We've gone from the stagnation of Patterson to the terror of Liston and have landed at the uncertainty of Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali, whichever the contemporaries preferred. The fear around Liston's mob ties were replaced with the horrors imposed by the champ's association with the Nation of Islam. The black Muslims now controlled the heavyweight crown. Contenders were lining up for their chance to bring the title back to America, but they'll have to wait because Sonny Liston will have his shot to prove it was all a fluke. Who you got this time? Can Ali repeat or will Liston prevail? And what of the coming Olympic class, specifically gold medalist Joe Frazier? And how about the vacancy of the WBA title? 1965 holds all the answers you seek. I'll see you there. The WBA's effort to crown their next title list in the aftermath of stripping Cash... Uh, 
Muhammad Ali culminated in this bout between veteran Eddie Machen and young, tall Ernie Terrell. The opportunity of his career for Machen, who was eight months removed from losing to Floyd Patterson. It was a boring affair spearheaded by Terrell's jab and holding otherwise. The crowd booed their disapproval specifically toward Terrell as Machen emerged as the undersized underdog. Terrell appeared to drop Machen early in the 10th, but it was ruled a slip. No knockdowns, no notable action, just a new, unnecessary complication of the title picture because of the pettiness of the WBA. Speaking of pettiness, Terrell said after how he wanted to fight the winner of the Ali Liston rematch and would not be fighting Floyd Patterson because when Floyd was champ, he didn't give anyone a chance. Still, the WBA wanted Terrell to match up with Floyd. Machen wanted a rematch, an idea boxing fans dreaded if it were to turn out like this fight. It's been over a year since the heavyweight title was up for grabs. Cassius Clay, I mean Muhammad Ali, sorry, everyone's still adjusting in a contemporary was ready to double down on his victory over Sonny Liston. As mentioned before, this fight was supposed to take place in November of the last year, but Ali developed a hernia three days before the bout. You may have also noticed that Ali no longer holds the WBA version of the title and is no longer undisputed. As mentioned, the WBA stripped him for rematching Liston because they didn't allow return bouts. The return bout was in a secret second contract kept secret so as to loophole around the WBA's rule. These two events threw the rematch into turmoil. While Ali healed from his surgery, Liston would have to ensure he was in shape all over again for the new date, as would Ali at that. The WBA's boycotting of the rematch led to some heavy politicking. Every United States state outside of California, Nevada, and New York were pressed hard not to sponsor the rematch. Massachusetts ultimately accepted at the cost of losing their boxing commission being on the board via suspension. As mentioned, Ali suffered a hernia and this was thrown to ribbons. Then the state began to suspect the promoters were corrupt and filed to block the fight, which would happen on May 7th. A new venue was desperately needed just 18 days before the fight. Governor of Maine John H. Reed emerged as the savior and the small town of Lewiston was set for history. It was the smallest city to host a heavyweight title bout since Jack Dempsey versus Tommy Gibbons in Shelby, Montana back in 1923. The ring was constructed over a hockey rink. Beyond this all, Ali and Liston remained controversial figures. Liston remained feared due to his association with the mob and his still impenetrable demeanor. Ali was now every white American's nightmare as a black Muslim, the group who preferred to whites as blue-eyed devils. Malcolm X was assassinated months before the fight after a nasty and public fallout with Elijah Muhammad. There were fears Muhammad Ali would be killed by Malcolm's followers after he publicly snubbed him following the latter's beef with Elijah Muhammad. Ali would later regret that he'd also fallen out with Malcolm before he was killed. Ali had 24-hour, 12-man security from the FBI, combined with the protection of the Fruit of Islam, the nation's paramilitary wing. Speaking of the nation, Liston's camp claim they received threats from the black Muslims. Isn't this a crazy state of events? The feared mob-tied Sonny Liston is the one being feared for. Out of the ring, at least. In the ring, Liston was a 13-5 favorite to regain the title. Finally, it's fight night. Ali said before that he had a surprise and that if revealed, it would stop anyone from wanting to see the fight. Ali once again came out in control and too fast for Liston. This time, Sonny looked to be targeting the body in an effort to slow the champion down for the later rounds. 
Then, in the blink of an eye, Liston was down. Did you see it? Look very closely. A short, jolting right put the challenger down. He rolled over, got to a knee, and fell to his back again. Ali, in disbelief, was yelling for Liston to get up as no one would believe this result, thus leading to the count being delayed by referee Jersey Joe Walcott. Walcott, if you remember, was the oldest heavyweight champion in history up to this point and a prominent name from the 50s timeline. His handling of this fight's end only upped the controversy. After getting Ali to a neutral corner, he returned and failed to pick up the count. Liston had been counted out, but Walcott wiped his gloves and left the fighters to go confirm things with the timekeeper. Ali and Liston resumed fighting before Walcott returned to declare Ali the winner. The weirdest, most controversial ending to a heavyweight title bout was over. If you think the cries of a fix in the first fight were something, you should already expect worse from this one. The strange nature of this affair is still felt to this day, almost 60 years in the future. George Chavalo climbed into the ring and shoved Ali, shouting that it was clearly a fix. Liston claimed it was a good punch that got him at first, but allegedly admitted after that he took a dive to avoid the crazy Ali and dangerous black Muslims. Numerous other boxing entities had differing opinions ranging from Ali knocking Liston out to the punch never even landing. There were demands for the abolition of boxing as a whole in the aftermath. Did Liston take a dive? Was he forced to by the mob? Did he bet against himself for the money? Did the Nation of Islam threaten to kill him? Was Liston's family kidnapped? Was Sonny afraid he'd be shot by followers of Malcolm X who tried to assassinate Muhammad Ali in the ring? Is this alleged fix connected to the alleged fix of the first fight? You decide. Ali Liston too remains the only heavyweight title bout ever fought in the state of Maine and arguably the most controversial affair in boxing history. What a story the locals will have for all of time. On September 8th, Ernie Terrell and George Chevallo signed to meet on November 1st for the WBA title. Terrell used his jab mostly en route to retaining the WBA title. Nothing much to write home about, but the aftermath was a little more exciting. Ernie complained of George headbutting him and stepping on his feet during the bout. The irony was that the champ was warned for thumbing. Irony of which you'll understand when we get to Terrell's opening match in 1967. Chivalo was so bitter over the bad hometown decision that he was willing to take it to the Supreme Court of Canada. This was Ernie Terrell's 15th straight win, and George Chivalo was no slouch, but everyone knew Muhammad Ali was the true champion. If Terrell is serious about proving his legitimacy, he needs to seek a fight with Ali yesterday. The good news was that this win put him in line for a bout with Ali, meaning unification may be on the horizon. The champ is back. After the bear, he swore to get the hair. The rabbit, as Ali named him, was former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson. Patterson refused to call Muhammad Ali by his new name, referring to the champion as Cassius Clay. He promised to bring the title back to America from the black Muslims. Ali, in turn, promised to humiliate the Uncle Tom. Ali, per usual, sold the fight well with his poetry and showmanship. Patterson fought with a bad back and had it worked on between rounds. As promised, Ali humiliated Patterson, dishing out a terrible beating and taunting the ex-champion mid-fight. Floyd took a knee after a jab in the sixth round. It looked like Ali could have stopped Patterson at any point, but carried on the beating until the fight was stopped. Ali was called cruel and selfish for his actions, in particular by the legendary Joe Lewis. Muhammad Ali 
was booed, but embraced it as he said he would before the fight. Ali praised Patterson as a good fighter in spite of his differing views. With this win, 23-year-old Muhammad Ali beat both the other significant heavyweight champions of the era in just one year, firmly establishing himself as the man beyond any further doubt. Now, if only Ingemar Johansson were still around. 1965 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. Muhammad Ali left zero doubt that he was the heavyweight champion with his conquests on the year. Well, almost. That phantom punch is sketchy, but a win is a win. The title is in the apparently consistent hands of our new champion. What a welcome surprise. Now, will he defend the title and not sit on it? According to him, yes. And yes, I'm aware that Ernie Terrell is the WBA titleist, but everyone knows who the true champion is. The man who beat Sonny Liston, of course. I invite Ernie Terrell to prove myself and the boxing world wrong in our assessment. It'll only make this decade more exciting if he does. The new year is shaping up to be the land of opportunity for our contenders. The champion who only looks to be improving, appears to be the beacon of the division. If Liston and Patterson couldn't beat him, what will the contenders hope to pull off? Well, we'll see. Oh, and don't forget the next class of Olympians held by Joe Frazier are on the come up still. Maybe unification will happen too. 1966 should be a good one. This was supposed to be a unification affair with WBA titleist Ernie Terrell in Chicago, Illinois, but Ali's draft classification was switched to make him eligible, and he publicly said he had no quarrel with the Viet Cong. It was demanded he apologized by the Illinois State Athletic Commission, but the champ refused, and the fight was deemed illegal. Terrell pulled out during the scramble to find a new setting for the fight, and it ultimately landed in Toronto against the Canadian champion, George Chevalo, on 17 days notice. Just four months after losing to Terrell and after having lost his last fight, Chevalo had another shot at the title. Ali and Chevalo had history. Remember Chevalo's reaction after the Liston rematch? Back in 1963, Chevalo also put on a funny showing where he dressed as a washwoman and taunted the then Cassius Clay. It's because Clay had deemed Chevalo the washerwoman for his fight style. Returning to the present, Ali convincingly outboxed Chevalo but failed to drop or knock out the rugged Canadian. To be fair, no one could. Still, Chevalo's bodywork sent Ali to the hospital, whereas he took his wife out dancing after the fight. This probably resulted from the moment where Ali held Chevalo and taunted him to hit him harder as George pounded away to the body. Ali held Chevalo as his toughest opponent yet. Since losing to Cassius Clay three years earlier, Henry Cooper had won six and lost two. Now he had a golden opportunity to rectify his sudden cuts loss in a rematch, one that was also for the heavyweight crown. Muhammad Ali, meanwhile, made it well known on British television that he did not like how Henry Cooper had dropped Cassius Clay back in 1963. He made the trip to England serious in his quest for revenge. This time around, Ali did not leave any opening for Henry's armor and slashed away, culminating in Cooper once again being stopped on cuts, this time in the sixth round. It was England's first heavyweight title bout in 58 years, a repeat of disappointment and frustration for the gallant Henry Cooper, but you can't knock a warrior for trying. That, and let's face the facts, the man can't help that he cuts easily. 
In his second defense as WBA titleist, Ernie Terrell scored a 15-round unanimous decision over Doug Jones. Another boring enough affair, but by now, Muhammad Ali and the Octopus had cleaned out the division and had little option other than unification. Also notable is that Terrell hashed out a competent decision over Doug Jones, a feat Cassius Clay didn't necessarily carry out back in 1963. Subtle jab en route to the inevitable clash of champions. One more bonus before we move on. The future baddest man on the planet was born two days after this affair. Continuing his tour as a fighting champion, Muhammad Ali next took on Brian London. London, since we last saw him in a near shocker of Ingemar Johansson, had remained inconsistent and lost his name bouts to the likes of Thad Spencer and Henry Cooper. As you can guess, Ali's growing ability and championship merit rendered London an ill-capable challenger. Muhammad Ali made quick and easy work of London, finishing the deal with one of the most beautiful barrages of punches one could hope to see. London looked helpless as Ali's show of speed overwhelmed him in the corner. London said after how he'd love a return bout, but only if 50-pound weights were attached to each of Ali's legs. The tour continues as Muhammad Ali shows how a true champion of the world defends with honor. Frequently, and key words, around the world. Up next for the self-proclaimed greatest is Carl Mildenberger in the first ever world heavyweight title bout held in Germany. Mildenberger was also the first ever Southpaw to contest for the heavyweight crown. Carl had spent the 60s competing for the European title, finally securing it in 1965. His only loss of the decade had come in his attempt for the title back in 1962 against Dick Richardson, in which he was knocked out in the first round. He'd beaten Eddie Machen and drew with Zora Foley en route to this, the opportunity of his life. How will he fare? Outside of a little southpaw jinx, Ali made easy work of Mildenberger dropping the German three times before the stoppage in the 12th. The champion looks better with each defense and doesn't seem to have a ceiling. Seven years later, Ali heralded Mildenberger as his toughest opponent to that date. Carl returned to defending his European title. Back home in America is the champion Muhammad Ali, this time against notable 50s contender Cleveland Big Cat Williams. Unfortunately, Williams was not the same man after being shot in 1964. His journey back to the ring involved multiple surgeries and losing nearly 60 pounds, which he had to regain in strength. Even so, there's no certainty he regained the power he was known for in the 50s. In spite of this, he won his four return bouts en route to challenging the champion. Remember Texas Patrolman Dale Witten, whose magnum accidentally derailed Cleveland's life and career? He visited the Big Cat before this bout to wish him luck. There were no hard feelings between the two men. Muhammad Ali, continuing his ascension, looked untouchable and invincible. He turned in what may be the most visually pleasing performance of his career dazzling with his speed and bamboozling Williams at every altercation. It was three rounds of boxing magic that you need to watch for yourself in full. The Ali Shuffle made its notable debut in this fight, only highlighting the champion's endless growing ability. Ali dropped Williams four times before the stoppage. For many, this is the Ali we would have loved to see against the opponents he would face in the 70s, namely Joe Frazier, George Foreman, and Ken Norton. One can only wonder. The Big Cat decided to hang up the gloves after this affair. It was impressive enough that he'd made a standing ovation worthy comeback from the accident. Farewell. 1966 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. What a showcase 1966 was for the champion. In a way, it showed just how much he'd improved as a pro. The display Ali had against Cleveland Williams in particular was brilliant. Even so, 
Ernie Terrell was still the WBA titleist. So what about unification? Not that we need it. Everyone knows Ali's the champ. But still, what about unification? There can only be one heavyweight champion. Though that man is Muhammad Ali, you can't help but wonder if Ernie Terrell can pull off a heist and become undisputed himself. I wouldn't count on it given how both men have looked in their fights, but it's possible. Fortunately, we'll have the answer to start in the coming 1967. Fasten your seatbelts. Muhammad Ali and Ernie Terrell were supposed to fight for unification, originally in 1966, as was mentioned. It fell through due to Ali's draft classification, a growing and looming threat to the impressive reign of the champion. The heavyweight title is finally to be brought back into one. The build-up to this fight saw Terrell join the Cassius Clay Club with Floyd Patterson in one of the most entertaining pre-fight interviews ever, at least in my at opinion. The, sound of the, bell, the moment Terrell the dared to call Ali Clay, Cassius Clay, a switch yes. flipped in the Cassius champ's head and he swore he would humiliate Terrell, Ali. as he did Patterson. He deemed the WBA title as to be an Uncle Tom and gave him a pimp smack for the ages. Terrell didn't let up, even singing a song to taunt Ali. This is one of those rare times where you'll witness a more so cruel Ali, as he followed up on his promise to deadly precision. Terrell suffered a tremendous beating at the hands of Muhammad Ali, who may have looked even better than he did against Cleveland Williams. The fight is famous for Ali talking massive loads of ish to Terrell, namely shouting, what's my name? As with Patterson, Ali could have finished Terrell, but dragged out the beating. Or could he? At the conclusion of 15 rounds, Terrell was a battered, unrecognizable mess, and Ali was once again the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Unopposed, undisputed, and unchecked. Terrell claimed Ali thumbed him, an irony that you should remember from the Shivalo bout. Maybe Ali had superpowers tied to the Houston Astrodome. First Williams and now Terrell, the man just looks oddly invincible when fighting here. The end of an era and you'll see why. The undisputed world heavyweight champion is back. A mere month later against another notable 1950s contender in Zora Foley. If you recall, this is a long overdue title shot for Foley and who other than Muhammad Ali, the people's champion, to give it to him. Ali once again looked tremendous even against the valiant offense of Foley. Zora managed to hit Ali more than any other opponent outside of George Chevalo had. Ali dropped Foley twice, the second earning him the knockout in the seventh round. And Ali hailed Foley as a better boxer than Sonny Liston, Floyd Patterson, and Ernie Terrell, crediting his opponent for managing to bother him. Foley praised Ali as being unbeatable by anyone around, claiming he knew because he'd fought them all already. It's too bad Foley was past his best by this point. Quick trivia. With this win did Ali fight and beat back to back the last man who beat Zora and then Foley himself. I mention that because he effectively ended the meaningful runs of both men and sadly his own as well. I hope you enjoyed this fight because it would turn out to be the final appearance of the athletic primed Muhammad Ali. Fans and experts were finally yielding realizing the greatness they were witnessing. Ali was being hailed as a heavyweight great in the same class as past legends like Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, and Rocky Marciano. The recently reunified heavyweight crown was to be thrown right back into turmoil to the dismay of boxing fans. Truly, the end of an era.
in the opening match of the WBA Eliminator Tournament to decide Muhammad Ali's successor to their title, Jimmy Ellis scored a ninth round TKO over Leotis Martin. Ellis was in firm control the majority of the way, bloodying Martin, but couldn't put his man away. Martin was bold, fighting through the rearranging of his face. Martin had not lost a fight since 1963, putting together 15 straight wins. Jimmy Ellis moved on and would face the winner of Mildenberger Bonavina the next month. One question though. What if this had been Ellis versus Joe Frazier as was originally planned? Maybe we'll find out down the line. Before we move on to, what a career turnaround for James Ellis. Asking Dundee to be his trainer and manager, accumulating eight straight wins before this bout, a remarkable development from being a middleweight to a heavyweight? It's hard not to root for him. On the same night in the main event, Bad Babe Spencer managed to thwart Ernie Terrell's chance of regaining the WBA title he just lost to Muhammad Ali six months earlier. Spencer managed the decision behind a second round knockdown of his larger and taller opponent. Terrell dropped Spencer in the fifth but it was said to be a push and not counted for the ex-champion. Ernie was also penalized two points for low blows in the tenth. If Terrell had won, he'd have become the second man to regain at least a portion of the title since Floyd Patterson overcame Ingemar Johansson seven years earlier. Everything went wrong for the 8-5 betting favorite Terrell. The Octopus would fight only once more in the 60s just two months later against Manuel Ramos in a unanimous decision loss. It was controversial as Terrell was thought to have controlled the fight, but apparently not. He left boxing for three years, returning in 1970. After a frustrating, perhaps corrupt, loss to Chuck Wepner, Ernie fought once more and retired after. Farewell, sir. Meanwhile, Thad Spencer had made a shocking turnaround and catapulted himself into contention. Never give up, kids. It was compounded by his scoring a seventh round TKO over conqueror Amos Lincoln in their trilogy bout. Don't stop, Thad. Keep on strong. Fun fact before we move on. The heavyweight Silver Age's Big Daddy was born five days after this doubleheader. The opening round roars on with a demolition derby. Former Muhammad Ali challenger Carl Mildenberger meets the rough and tough Oscar Bonavina who was riding high with nine straight wins post Joe Frazier. Bonavina dropped Mildenberger four times in the 1st, 4th, 7th, and 10th respectively. Carl never fully recovered from the first knockdown. He staged a rally in the 9th but was shut down in the 10th by the knockdown en route to dropping the decision to Ringo. Bonavina advanced to fight Jimmy Ellis. It's age meets youth again in the last of the first round bouts. Former two-time champion Floyd Patterson and youngster Jerry Corey engaged in a rematch of their draw four months earlier. This time, Corey won a majority decision behind two knockdowns in the second and fourth rounds, respectively. Despite the good start, Patterson showed his experience and took control as the bout went on, hence the unpopular decision. Patterson, again, has lost out on regaining the title, but you shouldn't expect him to give up just yet. Joe Frazier said after that he could knock either man out, citing how Patterson didn't apply enough pressure to Quarry. Quarry will next meet the rising Thad Spencer in the new year. How will the opposing styles of Jimmy Ellis and Oscar Bonavina clash? One is slick and the other is ragged. It's the first match of the semifinals, so who took it? It was Ellis by a tight unanimous decision started out strong but faded as the bout went on. A growing, potentially worrisome pattern. Ellis dropped Bonavina in the third and tenth rounds, but struggled against the strength of Ringo otherwise. Still, Bonavina failed to capitalize and Ellis had done enough for the nod when the dust settled. Impressive, given Ellis was the man who officially disrupted Bonavina post Joe Frazier. He awaits the winner of Jerry Quarry and Thad Spencer in the new year. The tide rolls on in the career 
of James Ellis. 1967 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. There can be no further question. Muhammad Ali is the heavyweight champion of the world. Wait, what? He's gone? Just when we finally had an undisputed champion on paper again, it's all thrown the flames. The WBA now seeks their newest title list, and the rest of the title lies in limbo around Ali. Well, the good news is that we should be in for some excitement due to it being any man's game now with the exile of Muhammad Ali. 1968 is bound to give us a new WBA and NYSEC title list. With Ali gone, all eyes have shifted to Joe Frazier given that he's the top contender. Still, Young Smoke has much left to prove before anything can be certain. Off to 1968 we go. In the last of the semifinal matchups, 7 to 5 favorite Thad Spencer met the dynamic, quick rising youngster Jerry Quarry. Spencer was now highly regarded and favored by some to win the tournament. Imagine the surprise when Quarry, who'd only been fighting just under three years, dominated the action. He dropped Spencer in the fourth and tenth rounds before securing the TKO with only three seconds to go in the 12th and final round. You can imagine the controversy. Jerry was ahead on all cards before the stoppage. Quarry had secured his spot in the finals against Jimmy Ellis. Had it all come crashing down for the babe? Sadly, yes. Bad Spencer would never recover from the shockwave of a derailment, losing all but one of his remaining career bouts. The non-loss was a draw. Spencer retired in 1971. It was made official on January 4th. History dating back to the amateurs was to reach its conclusion. Buster Mathis had always, somehow, gotten the better of Joe Frazier. He was the only man to beat Frazier in the amateurs. He beat out Frazier in the finals of the Olympic trials by wearing his trunks high to make it seem like Joe was punching low all while striking and running, which frustrated Frazier. Joe was so discouraged, he had to be convinced by Yank Durham to make the trip to Tokyo as a stand-in for Mathis. As luck would have it, Mathis was injured, and Frazier, who'd been a workhorse in Tokyo, would ultimately win the gold. So here we are, a chance for Mathis to prove the medal should have been his, and for Frazier to show he was the proper choice all along, and to avenge the unfair pickling he suffered at the hands of Mathis. Buster fought well, but as the fight dredged on, Schmoke and Joe wore Mathis down before finishing him in the 11th with the first knockdown of Buster's career. To clarify, Mathis rose, but was waved off. It was over. Joe Frazier was the heavyweight champion, or at least a portion of it. The Buster Mathis cloud had been banished for good. Frazier was by far the superior professional and had fulfilled his promise to become heavyweight champion by 1968. It's a shame it couldn't come against Muhammad Ali. Come to think of it, maybe the Mathis rivalry was why Frazier wasn't too big of a fan of the running style of the exiled Muhammad Ali, a rivalry you'll see unfold in the 70s. New York, Illinois, Maine, and Massachusetts recognized Joe Frazier as heavyweight champion. It's high prestige from New York. This is it, the finals for the WBA version of the heavyweight crown. It had been one year, give or take a day, since Muhammad Ali had rejected induction. Jimmy Ellis and Jerry Quarry clashed in a boring, tedious 15-rounder that was awarded to Ellis. Majority decision as Ellis stated range and scored while the 7-5 favorite Quarry never got it going, hindered also by a broken back. What a 
poor ending to an already questionable tournament. It only served to highlight Ali's absence, and most boxing fans knew the exiled champ could outclass either man with ease. Well, how about that? Even the winner of this so-called bogus tournament was a fighter who at least favored Muhammad Ali style-wise. Who's surprised? The career turnaround is also complete for James Ellis. It's not about how you start, kids. Next up ought to be Ellis and Frazier engaging in a unification affair. Let's hope for the best before the decade ends. The heavyweight titleist Schmokin' Joe Frazier is back in a short slugfest against Manuel Ramos. Ramos managed to stun Frazier with a good right but was otherwise battered in the two-round affair. He was dropped twice by Frazier, waiving his surrender after the second. Now, not only did New York, Illinois, Maine, and Massachusetts recognize Frazier as champ, so did Pennsylvania. Jimmy Ellis is back in his first defense of the WBA title. He's up against the only two-time heavyweight champion in history who's looking to win the title for a third time. Ellis would, again, win in controversy. To his credit, he battled through a broken nose to secure the decision. He was given a decision for landing more punches, though Patterson appeared to land the harder blows. Six out of eight ringside sports writers gave Patterson the nod. This only further highlighted that Muhammad Ali was the true king, and that out of the active fighters of the time, Joe Frazier was the best, not Jimmy Ellis. They've got to get it on soon so we can settle this. What do you think? Was Floyd robbed of becoming a three-time heavyweight champ? It's about time, the perfect time in fact, for a rematch. Schmokin' Joe Frazier looked to set the record straight with Oscar Bonavina, this time with Frazier's newly acquired NYSAC heavyweight title up for grabs. Bonavina was on the rebound from being eliminated from the WBA sweepstakes by Jimmy Ellis, but looked good enough with wins over Zora Fawley and Leotis Martin. The fight went the 15-round distance, but Frazier emerged more convincingly this time around as he took the fight to the tough Argentine. Bonavina's mistake was looking for one big bomb and staying with his back to the ropes. He was busted up badly by Frazier, but never wavered, getting some flurries in here and there. Schmoke and Joe even taunted Bonavina during the fight, begging him to mix it up and punch. I was close to saying Bonavina was Frazier's kryptonite, but the champ erased that here. Unanimous decision win. There are only two questions left. The desired unification affair between Frazier and WBA titleist Jimmy Ellis, and the winner of that affair against the hypothetical returning Muhammad Ali. We've got a ways to go before we have a heavyweight champion of the world again. 1968 is in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. Jimmy Ellis is the WBA titleist. Some would call him the great value version of Ali, a rather disrespectful deeming. Joe Frazier is the NYSAC titleist. The lineage remains unclaimed, while the WBC and Ring Magazine continue to recognize Muhammad Ali. We're a long way from stability. Unification is the best the division can do for us at this point, but there are no apparent plans. On top of that, Jimmy Ellis and Joe Frazier aren't out of the hot seat anyway, given they have titles to defend. The heavyweight division is in a scramble, plain and simple. We miss Muhammad Ali, even if just for the consistency. This is a mess. 1969 has a tall order if it wants to finish this up and down decade on a positive note. I guess we'll see. The train keeps rolling as Joe Frazier tunes up for the inevitable unification encounter with Jimmy Ellis. It's an easy first round knockout of Dave Zigglewitz, the second knockdown yielding the knockout. Zigglewitz was supposed to face Jimmy Ellis for the WBA title, but the champ pulled out due to fears of being racially cheated by the locals out of his crown. Now, Texas, along with Mexico and Argentina, have joined in recognizing Frazier 
as the heavyweight champion. To close out his 1960s campaign, Joe Frazier defended his title against Jerry Quarry. Quarry had lost in the finals of the WBA tournament to Jimmy Ellis, but rebounded well, highlighted by his unanimous decision over Buster Mathis three months earlier, as previously mentioned. Unfortunately, there's no footage of that fight, as I'd have documented it properly. A win here could boast well against Ellis in favor of Frazier before their unification bout. Remember that Quarry said as far as back in 1966 that he wanted Frazier and that he would plunk Smokin' Joe. Spoiler alert! This wound up being the fight of the year, with Frazier chopping Quarry up in a competitive seven-round affair. Quarry was waved off by the referee before the eighth could begin, and he did not protest, though he did weep. Frazier stamped the message home that he was superior and that he was coming for Jimmy Ellis. This was made more apparent by the encounter between the two in the ring after the fight. There can be only one course of action left, and that is unification. The 1970s is set for an amazing opener. I sure hope the rest of the decade can live up to it. 1969 and the 1960s as a whole are in the books. Here are the ring's top 10 heavyweights of the year. Much of the same, Jimmy Ellis and Joe Frazier are still the ununified titleists of this mess we call the heavyweight division. That's it. The good news is that the 70s appears to be on deck to yield a unified champion. The bad news is that the 60s ended on such an inconclusive note. Look forward to the future, boxing fans, for it holds all our answers. The crazy thing is that no one could have foreseen how the tumultuous 60s would produce what is to go down as the greatest decade for heavyweight boxing, the Golden Age. Spoiler alert. Hey you! Before we move on, if you're interested in more Muhammad Ali, check out my premium documentary covering every single fight in his professional career. You won't regret it. Click or tap the bubble in the top right corner, or you can go into the description, scroll all the way to the bottom, and select it from the list of promoted videos. Who doesn't want more Muhammad Ali? Come on now.